Dr. Doc, we spoke about uh, how you can download uh, the data that you want. So after downloading the data, I showed us the how you can import the data. There are many different kind of ways of importing different um, kind of data. So after after you have downloaded your data, the first thing that you do is to uh, carry out the quality control. Someone asked the other time while um, I was uh, delivering the first uh, on the on the first day. Someone was asking that how do you know if the data that you have you have has a good quality that is what uh, going ahead to do the analysis. So I told the person you can do that with the fast queue file from the, I mean, the, the, the files that the sequencing, the sequencing machine generated, which is the reads of the transcript. Then you can also, if you have now detected or if you are done with your um, data generation and um, you want to remove those low quality cells, the first thing that you do during analysis of a single cell or single nucleus RNA sequencing is to remove the low quality cells. We call it, you do the QC. The low quality cells are the cells that has, probably has um, high number of UMIs, which is the unique uh, molecular identification that I told you about. This UMI, uh, the one that, uh, that label the cells and the transcript. If you have high number of UMI and low number of features, features which are the genes, or you have high number of genes and you have low number of UMI, or you have doublets. Doublets are when a single uh, cell is expressing, or probably yeah, when a single cell is expressing two different kinds of genes um, that are peculiar to two cells, for instance, if a cell that's supposed to be expressing neuron, I exp uh, express that's supposed to be expressing neuronal markers, I express neuronal markers and microglia markers. So these cells, you have to remove them because it's going to skew your data when you are ready to uh, do different kind of downstream analysis. So the first thing is the QC, like it is done there, like it is said there, said the standard pre-processing workflow. You do the QC by removing low quality cells or dying cells, dying cells such as the mitochondria contamination, because it could be contam mitochondria contamination may occur when during the pro processing of your sample, if you have uh, done the homogenization too much or probably uh, something else, anything happens to the cell and the cell dies, the first thing it releases it uh, mitochondria transcript, then this mitochondria transcript can contaminate your, contaminate your work. So you have to remove these mitochondria genes. Then we calculate the mitochondria metric, which is the, this is the function for calculating mitochondria metric. It calculates the percentage of counts originating from a set of features. When you, may, when I'm, when you see counts, counts means the, the count is like you are counting the number of genes. So the count matrix, like I told us the other time contains um, your data, where the rows are the gene and the column are the cells. So you remove them. So let us start with uh, that. So the number one, the first thing is when you are carrying out your analysis, the first thing that you do is you set your working directory. Your working directory is where you output all of your results. The results that you are analyzing, it is where it will be going to, your output will be going there. So you have to specify that. And in R, backward slash doesn't work in R. So I change this path. I copied the path from, uh, the folder I want you to store. Then this is the path. Then I change the backward slash to forward slash. Then you have to put quotes here. If you did not put the quote, it will not work. Yeah, so it has worked. This is the code area, and this is the place that shows your results, which is called the console. 
it shows where it, it, you can follow how your code is running. And this place is the environment which shows the result of whatever code that you are running. So after, uh, after you have um, set your working directory, you have to also load in libraries. I told us about library. I told us about library, so Syrax. We are using Syrax work, so. Then we are using ggplot. ggplot2. Then, okay. We'll be using SCT library. SCT transform for our normalization. We'll be using another G plot as well. Yeah. For this DT plot is for plotting our data. I mean, yeah, then we using R color, want to using color uh, plots. So, Uh, yeah, so we'll be using all these for analysis. Yeah, let me run all these. This is where you run your analysis and you pick run selected line. I've selected all these lines. So you run it. Yeah. If this, any of this library, if it is not installed, it will not, it will not it will not be loaded, so I have to install it before loading it. I have um, I have um, showed us how to load the library, how to install library the last time. So I'm just loading the library after I install. So the one of our data today will be using three data because if you say we should use a lot of data, you know, during analysis sometimes it could some of the code could run for say 10, 15, 20 minutes if the data are much. So because this is a, it's a training kind of, so we have to like limit the number of um, samples that we want to run so that quickly um, some of the function will not take much time to run. So today I think we'll be um, running three, we'll be using three samples. Like the samples we have, the samples I downloaded last week, I have um, sectioned it into three parts. We have the control, we have the Ozemia disease, and we have the Parkinson's disease, PD, Ozemia disease and Parkinson's disease. Later, I'm choosing one of out of these three different groups of, uh, of disease condition. So number one, this is the control. What is, Control one. I told us the um, a a single cell RNA seq file contains three different kind of file. We have the barcodes, which is the cell. We have the feature, which is the gene, and we have the matrix, which is the count uh, the count matrix. The three together forms a gene matrix, uh, gene expression matrix. So. This is the function read m, m read empty x. Then the, this empty x is the matrix. I copied the path, which is up to this place, and the name of the file. You put it into quotes. Then you put comma. Then the features, which is the uh, gene. Then the path of the folder. That is this folder, the path. I copied it from here. I place it here. Then I copied this, the name of the file as well. 
So I copied it here. I change all backward slash to forward slash. Then the cells file, which is this barcode, I copy the path and the file number. So I put in bracket. Sometimes you have to open this individually to see if there are any things that you have to manipulate in the data. So I run it. So it's running now. This is how you know it's running that. This is our ant matrix. So like I told us, our gene expression matrix, the rows are the gene, while the columns are the um, cells. Let me open it so that we can see. Let me open it here, G, S, N. Yeah, this is it. Then I press enter. So this is it. This is a sparse matrix, but is another form of um, how to open uh, a count gene expression matrix. A, count, a gene expression matrix or gene counts matrix or sparse matrix are almost the same. The only difference that instead of zeros, it will be put in, it will be, it will be represented as dots. This dot means zero, so that uh, your the visualization will not be, you know, be so tight, and you, I mean, will, be, will not be disorganized. So it represents that zero. So these are the genes. These are the genes. These are mitochondrial genes. Then the rows. These are the rows. These are the cells. The cells. I mean, sorry. These are the cells, which are the color. This is a cell. This is a cell. These are the cells. So after reading it, in, then because it's a serial object, this data structure we are using is a serial. So we have to create a serial object of this um, of this um, gene expression matrix. So it will be create serial objects. The counts that you are using is this. Then the project, you now you can specify all other needs. The projects of the name of the project that you're analyzing. I put in there, your own project might be another thing that might be another name because we are using a putamen region of the brain from postmortem human samples. That's why I put human putamen. Then minimum of, I specify that, uh, out of in this particular data, it should only pick cells. I mean, it should only pick genes that are expressed in three cells, at least three cells, and then cells that express at least 200 genes. This is a standard. It's a standard from, um, Yeah, not this. So it's, a, it's like, see, this is a standard, this um, step is standard. Three minimum cells, 200 uh, minimum genes. Genes are features, then cells. Are, so you have to specify that. Then I run it. Yeah, so it says when the feature names cannot be underscored. So the feature and the cell's name, some of them comes with under with underscore, so it's replacing them with dash. So, and this is the object that I have created. So in this object, yeah, I want to, so in this object it says an object of class Surat, because this is the class of the object I'm working with. Then this object contains 28,595 features across 4,606 samples within one assay. It means that this particular object contains 28,595 genes across 4,606 cells. So we're having like almost 5,000 cells in this sample and 28,000 genes. And you're having one active assay, which is the RNA. Because you have not um, uh, you have not uh, analyzed anything, so it's only having RNA. So if you want to check the data structure, like I told us, the data structure. Let's see the structure of this uh, of this um, serial object. So 
once you put at, it will show you what this object contains. It contains the metadata. The metadata is uh, the part of the uh, structure that contains all the information. You can also include all other information into your object through the metadata. If you are to view the metadata, sorry. So your metadata contains your original identity, which is the human vitamin that I've put in. It contains the uh, It contains the end count, which is the count, which is the number of counts that is there of the RNA. Then it contains the count of the um, gene as well. So then, it also contains assays different assays. It could be in this assay, it, says it is RNA. It is only RNA that is here. So if as we proceed in our analysis, you see some other assays that will be seen there. You can see the SCT transform assay. You can see the integrated assay. So it depends on the assay that you want to use. But it contains, for now, it contains RNA assay. Then it, active assay. That is, if you want to specify which assay is active, it is more, if it is more than RNA, if there are other assays there, and you want to see the assay that is that you are currently using, then from here, we can see the active assay. Then the active identity, if you want to see the identity of the particular, uh, of, of that particular object, you can come here and check it. Then graph, neighbors, reduction, uh, images, project name, any other thing that you want to use is contained in this object. So let us proceed. So you want to specify some things. Like I told you, in the metadata, you can, you can input anything that you want to uh, input there so as to, you know, uh, uh, so as to follow. So as if you want your, uh, if you want the particular sample to be identified in a certain kind of way, so you can input whatever you want there. So from here, I want to input the genotype. The genotype means, let's say, the um, disease condition, and this is a control. I will just say the object metadata. Then dollar means open another column. If you are conversant with um, coding or the analysis in R, we mean that dollar means open a column. Even when you are when you are working with a data frame, and you want to specify a column, you use dollar. This dollar sign. So that means open a column, name it genotype, and the um, elements of that particular column should be controlled. You assign it. This is assigned. Uh, it's called assigned symbol. It is less than then uh, a, 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 an iPhone control. You have to put it in brackets because it's a character. This is a character. Uh, it's a character element. So you put it. So if I want to view metadata again, you see the genotype there. See, this is the genotype. That means this particular sample is a control sample. Then also you want to change the, uh, you want to change the original identifier, right? You also want to change the original identifier. So you open another space called old identifier. Then you um, specify it to be your, actually don't let us use this particular. We don't want to change. We don't want to create another uh, column called old identifier. So I want to change the original identifier. I mean, the original identity. Initially, the original identity, the original identity is glutamine, but it's a control. So I want to 
write this in full because it's a co first control, the control number one samples. Out of the sample that I downloaded, there are four controls, but this is control one. So I want you to be the original identity of this particular object is control one. So I open, I because I'm working with this particular column and I want to change the content of this column, then I will write the name of this column after open dollar sign, open this column, which is the original identity column, and then name it control one. Assign it to control one. Yeah. If I look at it, it would have changed. You can see it has changed. So because I want to also see, put in the brain region that I'm working with, the brain region I'm working with is glutamine, then it will be there. Then I want to uh, specify that this is the GSM number, that is the geoaccession number of the, uh, of the data I'm working with. You can see pre region, vitamin, GSE number. This is it. So, if you want to put in put any other thing into this object, this is the way you do it. So, after that, then if you want to check the row names, row names mean the row, like I told you before, the row are the genes. So if you want to take the role name, you can just put role names, then the object, then the assay that you are using. The assay is the RNA, then the dollar sign RNA. These are the genes. It gives you the genes. You know, the initial we say we have like 28,000 genes. So the for the like I said, the first thing that we are going to do, be doing is the quality control. The quality control is you want to check the number of mitochondria. Um, genes and you want to remove these mitochondrial genes. What you can first do is to check if uh, mitochondrial genes are present in your sample. So this means, grep means check through all these particular objects and grab anything that has empty as the subscript with I think. So grab this pattern and this pattern in this particular genes, you not know, these genes, and tell me the value, I mean, tell me what they are. So you can see these are a lot of mitochondrial genes. These are, and you have to remove this mitochondrial gene so that it will not affect your data analysis. So like, so we'll now be using this, um, function. As I said to the this operator can have a column. You can either use double bracket or you use dollar sign to open a um, like I told us to open a column in your metadata, and you can use it to store the number to store the result of your calculation, which is the percentage future of you calculate the number of mitochondrial gene per the cell in your sample. So this is the object, then open this, and the, <clears throat> the function is percentage feature set, then your um, object, then the pattern is this. So it will grab this pattern and open a column in your metadata to store the results of this particular function. Let us run it. So if you check your objects, your metadata, you can see this is percentage empty. So this is a cell. So this is the um, value of percentage empty in your cell in this particular cell. This is another cell. This is the value runs through. You having like 4,606 cells. This is the number of cells that you have now. These are the cells. And this is the full value of the mitochondria um, gene for each of the cell, each of the cell. Then after that, you start your QC. Then you want to see, you want to visualize uh, 
the number of counts of your cell and the number of counts of your gene. So this is the function. This is your, the, it's a PNG. If I want to make it a PNG file, then these are the parameters of how you want the uh, PNG file to look like, the width, the height, then the volume plot. That's, that's what I want to do. The volume plots, I, I want to make it out. So this is the, you specify your object. Then the features that you want to plot is, you combine the feature that you want to plot, which is the end feature, that is number of genes, count of genes, count of cells, and also the percentage mitochondria. Then the column should be like three columns. You want to plot these three things. So you specify the number of columns, and column to be three. Then you, Let's run this. So let's go to our, because I have specified the working directory, I have set my working directory, all the results will be coming here. So this is the result. I'm coming. Yeah, this is the result. So this one has like 9,000 counts of genes like 60,000 cells. This is the number of cells, then the percentage mitochondria and the count. So after that, you have seen that then you can also plot another thing. You want to plot a filter, filter plot. I mean, a plot that has a filter, feature scatter. Then I'll specify my object, the feature one, end count. Then feature two, parasitic mitochondria. Then another one, end count. And then uh, end feature, number of features. So let me. So this shows that you are plotting my uh, percentage mitochondria on the y axis and the number of counts and the end count of the cell on the x, x axis. Then this particular plot, you are plotting the count of genes on Y axis and the count of cell on X axis. So it's supposed to be a linear, if you can uh, see, it's supposed to be a linear, uh, uh, a linear, like a linear graph. The higher the count of genes, the higher the count of cell. Now, if the count of gene is small, and the, the count of cell is small. That means that particular cell is uh, uh, it's a low quality cell. For instance, every dot, I suppose to mention this, every dot on this plot represent a cell. So like we said, we have like 4,600 cells. So these four points that are here represents 4,600 cells. So you can see like this, is like going to be like an outlier. These cells are outliers like this. They are not with all these other cells. So we can cut off this particular place. Then this is mitochondria gene. Uh, number count of mitochondria genes, then count of cells. <laughs> you can see like they count these four cells that are like an outlier here. We have to remove it. So after going through the uh, the results of the uh, Q, I mean, the results, the QC for this particular object, then we can rearrange, <clears throat> we can reorder the end counts in decreasing, I mean, in increasing order. This is the end counts. We have to rearrange it. How is it crazy? So, yeah. Sorry. So we have to remove this place and we have to, if we are working with human sample, the minimum percentage of mitochondrial gene that should be in your sample, human sample is 5%. If, it's, if you are working with mouse or yeah, if you are working with mouse sample, then the minimum percentage should be 5%. This is a standard. 
that has been recorded. So, the, and this one is going to like 20, 40, 60, more than 40% of mitochondria G in this particular sample. So we have to cut it to be like 10% somewhere around here. You have to cut it out. Then you have to cut the number, you have to cut out these four outliers too, to be like, let's say 5,000 cells here. Yeah. So we now specify it like subsets is the subset function that we, that we use. This is the, uh, um, the object that you are working with the sample. Then you subset out the N feature should not supposed to, you, you retain the N feature that has, that, that has, five, that, that has uh, more than 500 counts. That is the genes that has more than 500 counts. And the cells that has less than, we suppose we should, we said we should cut out these ones. That is, this one will now be 50,000. Right, so less than 50,000. Let me check it and count and percentage mitochondria that is less than 10. Those are the ones that you want to retain, the other one, it will remove it. So then we, we assigned it another name. This is the name that we're working with before. Then we assigned it, and we assigned this particular sample another name, which is this. So this is it, this is the result. Before we did the QC, it is 299, 298 MB. After it is 268 MB. Then you can view whatever the result that you have there. Then we are now plot, we can now plot the way we have plotted before the QC, we can plot it after the QC to see, to visualize the result. And I've given it the name. This is the name I've given it correlation. Then after QC variant plot. So yeah. So this is before QC. This is after QC. Let us see now. This is our results. Yeah. This was before. This is after. So I have reduced the mitochondrial genes to 10% from almost 60%. Then I have removed outliers from this particular, uh, this particular the count of cells. I have removed like 10,000 cells, not 10,000 cells, but I have reduced it. I have removed these two outliers, these four outliers. Then I have removed any cells that has less than 500 genes, I have removed it here. So 500, that has less than 500 and the remaining, then this one was out. So this is our result. So this is after correlation, this after correlation, then this is before correlation. This is before correlation. 10 percent, it was 60 percent before. So this is the result. And we can see this one has increased, the R value has increased here. So that means our result is fine. So that's for the first sample. The same thing that we did for the first sample here, we did we will also do for the second sample. We will this is the, we assign, then this is the uh, files. The, first, the same thing we did for the first one. We do it for this one, create this. I removed this part, the first one. So because they are close to each other, if I run this, it will run the three, I mean, the four things together. AD2, AD2, AD, original identity will be AD2. So the same thing that I did for the first one, check the row names, that is the gene name. Then grab, check if there are mitochondria genes, there are mitochondria genes. Then calculate 
the mitochondria gene for each of the cells in the sample, then draw the matrix before QC. So we, this is before QC. We are working with AD sample, AD2, AD2. Then we arrange, then um, subset out the mitochondria genes that are present there, less than 5,000. Let's check for this. Let us remove like these are two outliers. Then this should be supposed to be around 6,500. Yeah, 6,000 or let's say yeah, 6,500. Let's remove these two outliers and let's remove this to be 10%. So end count is 60,000, 60,500. Oh, sorry, 65,000 rather. 5,000, yeah, at 10%. Then plots end count. Yeah, plot this. Now let's see. This is control control A D one before correlation A D before correlation. A D volume plot. This is A D after correlation, so we can view it. Yeah. Yeah. So I have removed these two, these two cells. Then I have cut out this or this start to thirty to I've cut it out to I've cut it down to ten. So we we'll do the same thing for another sample, another sample, which is the PD sample, because I'm choosing one sample. I can run everything. Move this specify. Create serial object. Any cells that is as less than three cells, any genes that are expressed less than three cells and genes that is that express um, 200 genes so at least 200 genes check number grab mitochondria genes so the same thing that we did for the others we also do for this as well so we arrange after rearranging, let's check which of the parameters we are going to use. Yeah. So this is like 500,000 kind of, or 50,000 rather. So let's remove these three, three cells, right? So, yeah. This will be 50,000. Yeah. It. After combination, you can see I've removed. 
So yeah, once we are done, we are done with the three samples. We are done with the QC for the three samples. Then what we now do is, we now combine the three samples together. So this is the result of the QC for the three samples. We combine it, we combine it. So this is the first sample, the second sample, and uh, the third sample, right? Because this is, this is the result here. This is the result here. And this. So we combine the three samples. So to be the list. So we have created a list. If you check this, yeah, this is the first. This is the second sample, and this is the third sample. So this sample contains So after you can save this list, if you want to save it, you can save it to be an RDS file. If not, if you want to continue, you can continue. But we want to increase the size of this particular environment because sometimes if you did not increase it, if the uh, file that you are um, analyze, analyzing has a bigger size, this the code will not work anymore because there will be no space, there will be no size to accommodate. I mean, there will be no space to accommodate the size of the, of any particular uh, object that you are analyzing. So we have to increase the size of this space. We increase it. Yeah. So. The first thing I don't want us to, this does not need this another thing. I'm checking another thing here. So you don't need this particular thing. So what you want to do is you want to transform, uh, you want to uh, do the normalization. You want to do the normalization in the sense that in this particular samples, some genes might be uh might my, my be ex you don't want to you don't want to you don't want a particular um gene to be much more highly expressed than the others like um let me find a better way to put it i think it is much more explanatory on on here yeah you have to normalize it uh let me find how they define normalization so say after removing unwanted cells, which are the uh, QC from the data set, the next step is to normalize the data. By default, we employ a global scaling method, which is the log log, normalize, log normalization that normalizes the expression, the feature expression, the feature that is the gene expression measurement for each cells by the total expression, multiplied by the scale factor 10,000, and you then log transform the result. So what it means is that there are some genes that the way they are, they are much more expressed in that particular, in a particular, uh, let's say sample, but that is not the real sense of it. So you have to like, uh, you have to, you have to put it, you have to make them uh, express in a kind of way to show that they are, they are normalized. I mean, they are normal expression. The total expression of the genes you pick the expression of those genes, then you divide by the total expression of all the genes, then you multiply it by scale factor. So you want to normalize, and at the same time, you want to do the scaling. The scaling in the sense that some genes are, uh, some genes are, uh, that is what you call the batch effect. Batch effect means, that you have you process the samples in different batches. If you process the samples in different batches, let's say for instance, while you are um, preparing your sample to for sequencing, you pick one sample because the 
sequencing machine can only accommodate the um, eight different kinds of samples at once. And from this, you have like 12 samples, right? So you cannot carry out the same sequencing at the, um, you, you, don't, you, you, you cannot carry out sequencing at the same time. For instance, you are working with a test tube. You're having eight test tubes. It's like you're having eight test tubes instead of 12 test tubes, right? So, and you cannot do that 12 test tube at once because you are limited. I mean, you cannot do 12 samples at once because you are limited because of the um, eight test tubes that you have. So you have to pick from each of the conditions that you have. Let's say you um, for, for this condition, we are having AD, PD, and control, right? So you have to make sure that one of each of these conditions goes in the um, go go into the test tube first. So instead of doing eight at once, you can do six to accommodate like two from control, two from uh, what's it called? Two from control, two from um, AD, and two from PD. So that is six. You have done six. Then that's the first batch. Then the second batch will be two from control, two from AD, and two from PD, which makes six. Then you do the second batch. So if you are doing these batches, there will be a technical variation in the results of these two batches. So to cancel out the technical variations in the results from these two batches, it's like when you are pipetting. You pipette one test tube and you pipette another test tube. It may, your pipetting might not be in quotes 100% correct. You get, there could be a variation between pipetting from one test tube to the other. So to remove this effect, the variation, the technical variation between these two batches, you have to do the scaling, which we correct for the batch effect. So you do the scaling after normalization, you do the scaling. So, but recently there is, um, a, a function that was developed called the SCT transform. This SCT transform do the normalization at, and the scaling at once. That means you don't want to be doing normalization, then again, do the scaling. So once you use this SCT transform, it does the uh, two, it does the normalization and it, it does the scaling at once. So that is the function that we'll be using. So this is the code Apply to all the objects in this list using the function SCT transform, the method GLAM, a general um, procedure modis model use this method for doing the SCT transform because this method actually makes it fast. It makes the um, analysis fast. Then vast to regress is this and this. Then the verbose to show the results. I mean, to show the, to plot the results, you said no, F false. So this is what you use. Then you assign what you want it, your results to be. So let us run this. So this could take a while because you are doing log transform and also you are, you are doing the uh, normalization and the um, scaling at the same time. So it could take a while. But because of this, this can make it faster. And we are using three samples. If it's good, if we if we are using more than three samples, like if you are using if you are doing the whole 12 samples at once, it could take like 10, 15 minutes for this function to run. But I think because we are doing three samples at once, we are analyzing three samples at once, probably it will be more than three, four minutes. Yeah, let's wait for um, that to for that to be done. So once it is done, the results will come here. So, and after the results come here, so um, come in, let's, okay. You see the results, which is, you have assigned this. In R, this means like you are saying equals to, this less than then I think sign is it's less than you are equal to that means you are assigning this particular function this particular uh, you want to assign this particular 
uh, function, what is the calculation to the results to come into, you assign it this uh, name. You can choose any name that is convenient for you. So just make sure that the names that you are using, you'll be able to remember and you, the, the names will not um, go against, uh, I mean, you'll be able to remember and it will be able to track whatever analysis that you are doing. So, yeah, so it has, it has finished analyzing. So this is the result. You can see now. So it does. Then after that, then you have to do the integration. The integration is another way of removing the batch effect as well. You have to do the batch correction too <clears throat> in the integration. So for you to do the integration, you first do, you prepare these objects in this list, the one that you have doing, that you have done the normalization and the um, scaling, you have to prepare them for integration using, oh, before that, you have to, yeah, select the um, variable features. The next thing is you select the top consistent highly variable genes. That is the highest, you don't want all the genes at once because some of the genes might not make any biological sense. But the ones that are highly expressed, the first, like 3,000 genes that are highly variable is the one that you want. So you specify 3,000, some is 2,000, some choose 1,000, it depends on the quality of your object or the quality of your sample. But this I'm choosing 3,000, so it will choose 3,000 highly variable genes. So this 3,000 highly variable genes is the one that we are hoping that we have biological sense, it will have biological meaning. So then you prepare for integration using the objects, this list that contains this object that you have um, um, done the normalization and the scaling, then choosing the highly variable genes that you have. So that has, so in preparing for the, you now do the integration itself. So this is the integration. Then you, we are running PCA. Then the features, the highly variable features, number of um, dimension that you want to choose, 50 dimension. So you run it. That's finished running. The result is here. So after prepare, after doing that, then you now do the real integration itself. So um, because you can have, like I said, it's supposed to be twelve samples, but we just want to see three samples. So we are doing the uh, is we. The method that the method for uh, the integration is called the um, canonical and correlation analysis. That's what we want to use for the uh, integration. But we want our result to be fast, right? So we have done the RPCA here instead of we don't want to do the um, correlation well, canonical correlation analysis for our integration. So we want to make it fast. So we use the repetitive reciprocal uh, canonical correlation analysis. So we have to choose a reference. We're having three samples. We have to choose two of the samples to be our reference, right? So we have chosen sample two and sample one. Sample two, I'm coming. Yeah, sample two, this sample two and sample one. Is the one that I want to use for our um, correlation, for our integration. If the samples are much more, sometimes you work with more than 20 samples. Sometimes you can work with more than 30 samples. So you have to choose each sample from each condition you are working on for the correlation analysis. 
and you have to choose the sample that has the highest number of cells, all right? How to know the sample that has the highest number of cells is you, we have three samples here, right? We have control, Parkinson disease, and then um, uh, Parkinson disease and uh, uh, what was it called? And um, Alzheimer disease, AD, PD, and control, all right? So you can know the ones that as you check the media. Sorry. The media. Then you, name of the object. The object is GSM. Let's say control one at metadata. So you should choose, you want to use, sorry. Okay. Yeah, this is the object, sorry. The first object you created, objects. Yeah, that's control, the metadata, then the count of cell. This one has 3,500 as the median, you calculate the median, <clears throat> the median count of the cell. Then this next one is OBD. So, AD. AD. This one is the third one. AD. So the one that has the highest value is the one you choose here, the second. The AD, let's see which one is this second. AD, this is AD, this is PD, this is control. So the second and the top, two, three, yeah. Then the number of dimension that I want to use, 30, first to 30, then the app core feature, which is your future set. Then we do the integration. So to calculate the time that we use for the integration, if you have like more than 20 um, samples that you are analyzing or more than 30 samples that you're analyzing, it could take as small as two hours, three hours, if you have much um, samples for this integration to be done. If you don't have, like I have only just three samples, probably it should not be more than five, seven minutes for it to um, finish running. So you have to run the integration and um, remove all the batch effects or all the technical uh, variation so that when you are analyzing, when you are doing the downstream analysis, your sample will give a biological uh, a biological meaning, because the essence of all this analysis that you are doing is to extract out the biological meaning of all the samples. It depends on the question you are asking. If you want to check the trajectory analysis or probably see uh, the difference in transcriptome of Alzheimer disease compared to Parkinson disease, or probably you are working on liver, probably liver disease. You want to see the difference in transcription, transcriptome of maybe if you are working on mice that has liver disease compared to the um, uh, compared to control. So yeah, this is just two minutes. You can see it's it's not that much. If we did not use this RCP and um, this um, reciprocal correlative 
canonical correlation analysis, it could take somewhere around 10 minutes if we did not use it, but we are using this, so it should be done in no time. So after running this, okay, this is called the anchor, the fine integration anchor. Then after the anchor, you do the integration itself. 56 seconds. Should we be done? So the reason why you are choosing this dimension, I will still tell us because each of the cell in your sample will at the end of the day form a dimension. We 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 is is it is a dimension that has finished. So we run the integration. So each cell is a dimension, will be a dimension, will represent a dimension. So at the end of the day, we'll do the dimensionality reduction. So you can imagine we are we are having like 4,000, I mean, sorry, yeah, yeah like 4,000 cells, right? If we, from one sample, if we say, let's say, yeah, we're having like, we have done uh, QC, so we have removed some low quality cells here. So this one, we're having like 3,000 cells. This year, we're having three, four, almost 4,000 cells. Here, we're having like 2,300 cells. If we, if you put it together, you're having like close to, I think, eleven thousand cells. So each of the cell, we give we we have its own dimension. So and you cannot, like, be taking all the dimension. So you have to reduce the dimension. So we are picking only just thirty dimension out of all these dimension. So. <clears throat> At the end of it, we do the dimensionality reduction. Dimensionality reduction is so that you we um, we call it, which is the principal component analysis, so that we reduce the dimension of all these like thirty thousand. I mean, sorry, eleven thousand dimension. We go out, we reduce it. So after reducing it, and then we now plot only just two dimension, which will give us the result of all our cells. I mean, to see each of the cell. In a particle in a in two dimensions. So the our integration has finished running. Then we choose one to 30 dimension. You can choose any dimension here. Then run the PCA, which is the principal component analysis. This is your result of the integrated uh, mitigation. Then from your results here, you do you run the U map, the U map is for visualization, uniform, uniform manifold approximation um, projection. That is the uh, full name. So you want to use, you want to, you want to visualize your results using this UMAP. UMAP is, a, is also a way to carry out the dimensionality reduction. But here we are using it to view our results. So the reduction that you use, the dimensionality reduction is your PCA which is your principal component analysis, the dimension that we have specified at DIMs is one to 30 dimension. Then you find neighbors. It's a way of um, getting your, uh, of representing yourself in your dimension. You find neighbors and the end of the day you find clusters. So let's run this set of codes. So the find cluster is, the ones that's going to put your uh, results into clusters, your cells into clusters. Remember, we are using brain here. So in the brain, you have different kinds of cells. You have the uh, uh, you have the astrocytes, you have uh, the neuron, you have oligodendrocytes, oligodendrocytes, because also there are different kinds of cells. So yeah, it has finished running. Then we run the find cluster. So here we have, 22 clusters here. So let's visualize our cluster. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have named it to be, this is the name. We are using dimension of 30 and resolution of 0 0.7. This is the resolution we are choosing. The res this resolution means the granularity. You want to check, you want to use the granularity of your result. It means that the um, higher 
your resolution, the higher the number of clusters you are going to be getting. So our results, let's see the results. So this is the result. Each point here, each point on this U map, like I said before, is the U map uniform manifold approximation projection. There are different, we have like 11,000 uh, 11,000 principal, uh, 11,000 cells. That would be 11,000 principal components. And out of the 11,000 principal components, we reduce it and we are just visualizing only two components of, of it, of the uh, reduction process. So you map one and you map two. You cannot plot 11,000 dimension principal, I mean, sorry, 11,000 principal component. So out of the 11,000 principal components, we are just plotting only two components. And this represents the other, cell, um, other components too. So each point on this U map is a cell. So you have in AD control one and PD three, which are your origin identity. So I separate, I um, find, I found the cluster here. The visual, I visualize it on this right, I mean, on this left hand side by their uh, original identity that is their sample. You can see you have red as AD, then blue, I mean, sorry, green as control, blue as PD. You can see red, blue, green in all these um, cluster. No cluster is separated by, uh, by the sample, right? You don't have a cluster that is okay. This cluster is only for Ozemia disease, no. Because every of this sample contains all the cells of the brain. So each of these is a cell. So what we are now, what we will now do that, what is the identity of this cluster? What is the identity of this cluster? And the beautiful thing is it has labeled each of this cluster, each of this cluster. So if you want to check what this small cluster is, sorry, what this small cluster is, that means you have to increase the resolution, the resolution that we use is, is 0 0.7. If you increase it to like 0 0.8, it's most likely that the cluster will increase. Or if you increase to like 1.0, the cluster will increase to let's say 23. Let's, let's see, it. let's try. It. Let's say we increase the resolution to 1.0. You can see we'll be having 26 clusters. So let's, Plot it. This is it. You can see we're having 26 cluster from zero to 25. 26 cluster. Let's see which of the cell are not labeled before. That is, sorry. Yeah, so you can see this, this as this label additional, gives additional label to this. You can see this one. It wasn't here before. You can see this is only just one cluster, but here it has divided it into three clusters. So if you want to like label, more of the cluster. So to see what is the identity of this particular cluster, you have to label it, you get. So you can label it by increasing the resolution of your, uh, of your, of your um, analysis, you get. So what we now do is we did not know the identity of this cluster. It could be, this could be neuron, this could be astrocyte, this could be OPC, this could be, uh, um, parasites, whatever. So all these cells, they have their gene, they have their particular uh, gene that they express that are specific for them. They have their canonical markers, their canonical genes that they express. So what we do next is now, okay. I want to show us something. Now, before we started, each of the samples has 
one assay, which is the RNA assay. We want to check how many assays are there now. So. You can see we have the RNA assay. We have the SCT assay, which is the transformation, which is the normalization and scaling assay. Then we have the integrated assay. So many at times, if you want to check the real sense of what is the biological sense of what is happening, we use the normalized and yeah, the normalized assay, which is the SCT assay. So here, we want to uh, see the genes that are expressed in each of these clusters. So what we do is we um, change the default assay. The default assay now, let's see the default assay. Uh, if you want to see the default assay, we say, sorry. we go to active assay. The integrated one is the one that is active now, but we want to use the normalized assay. So we change it to a normalized one, which is the SCT, default assay of this to SCT. So if you want to check it again, you see it would have changed to, that's changed to SCT. So we want to find conserved markers. Conserved markers means Conserved marker means what are the genes that are expressed, let's say in this particular, uh, in this particular cluster relative to all other cluster. What are the markers that are expressed or genes, markers or genes that are expressed in this cluster too, relative to all other cluster. So we want to do that and you have to, um, you have to specify a cutoff, that is a, uh, yeah, a cutoff from it. <clears throat> so you are using, this is your, this is a loop, uh, um, a loop um, function. This is a loop function. So you say for I in zero N levels of blah, 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 this. Sorry, I can't, <laughs> I can't start explaining this code. So, but the most, the most important thing is to find the clusters. This is your um, object. The assay that you want to use is SCT. The slot, you are using your data slot. Then the test that you are using, the statistical test you will use is the Wilcox ranking, Wilcox rank, rank sum test. So this test will rank it. Hello? Is anybody saying anything? Please go on. So we are we don't want to use T tests for that. We are using this Wilcox Wilcox ransom test is still much more better than um, T test. So we use this test. Then you want to um, you want cells that are expressed. You want genes that are expressed in twenty percent of the cells. So you specify its minimum percentage. 0 0.2, then the identity, because we are using a loop function, we put our I, then the group is the genotype. We want to group it according to genotype. Genotype in the sense that you have your control, you have your AD, and you have your PD. Then you have both. Then only point, only positive to be true. Then we correct UMI, we put it at false. <clears throat> then these are just loop. If anybody is conversant with uh, uh, programming, how to write code, be able to understand this loop function. But I don't want to start explaining the loop function. That's not the what the uh, primary function of what you are here for. So sorry. So it says object contains multiple model with unequal library size. 
run PCT find markers before running find markers. So um, coming. Uh, Uh, suppose not to like ask for this since I'm I'm specifying the correct UMI. Run again. Okay. All right. Um is saying that we should run PCT find markers. So we'll run the PCT find markers. Just give me a minute to time. No comment. Okay. Okay. But also. So we'll see to be. Mm. Suppose not to ask for um, so uh, 
sorry, supposed not to be asking for because I've set the recorrect UMI to false. So supposed not to ask. Yeah, supposed to be false. Yeah. <clears throat> mm. I don't know what is the problem with this. Call this. Sorry, I don't know what is wrong. So what I want to do here is to like I, I was saying before that, but I don't know why you say can't find the function prep find markers function. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so what I wanted to do is, I don't know what is, it should run, but <sighs> just the most important thing is now, I don't know what is, probably something is wrong with the data kind of, but what I just want to get out of this place is it will um, get the conserved markers for each of the um, clusters. So let me show you how the concept marker is going to look like. Um, from some of the analysis that I've done. Yeah. So it's going to look, it's going to output if Assuming this code run, at assuming this code has run, so I will output it in CSV file. So the CSV file is something like this Excel file, it's an Excel file. But once I open the Excel file, so. Once I open the Excel file, yeah you will see something like this, which we have the genes. Then you will see, let's say this, we are, we are using control, but here it's, uh, it's another sample that I've analyzed for before. Um, this is a multiple sclerosis um, sample 
multiple sclerosis, you prob if it is control AD and PD, you will see control AD and PD. You will see their average, their p-value. If it is control, you see the p-value of the control. Then you see the average express, average log P, 2FC. Then you will see the percentage, then the percentage two. Then you see the adjusted p-value. Then you will see the second um, genotype because we have specified, here we have specified to group it in genotype. And we have three genotypes here. We have the AD, we have the PD, and we have the control. So to come here, because here I'm using just MS and the chronic um, inactive, whatever. So it will have the, let's assume we are, this is the control, the result for the control. Then the next one will, the, will be the um, AD, the p-value for the AD, the average log 2FC, average log fold change, then the percentage one, then the percentage two, then the P adjusted value, and the P val and the minimum P val for the two, oh, sorry, sorry. After that, we have the PD, we have the PDP value, we have the PD uh, average log um, two four change, we have the percentage one, percentage two, and the P adjusted uh, value then all of which is going to have maximum p-value and the minimum p-value. So you have those three. So it will now give us the uh, genes that are expressed. It will now give us the genes. It will separate it according to the cluster. You have a CSV file, for cluster eight, you have a CSV file for cluster zero, one, two, three. So you are you'll be having 25 CSV file. So and each of the CSV file will contain uh, markers that are conserved in that particular cluster relative to this number one. So we have it or sub markers. We have markers in two, three, four, five to 25, every of these things, every of these clusters, we have the AWO marker. So at the end of the day, we will now test which markers are expressed in 21 and which markers are expressed in two, which markers are expressed in one, zero, and 20. If these two markers are markers of, say, neuron, for instance, a marker of neuron, example of marker of neuron is SYT, canonical marker of neuron is SYT, um, that is an absin. Um, you it's also express uh, um, uh, some uh, synaptos, yeah, synapsin. Then you have uh, RBF, RBFOX3. We have markers of neurons like that that will be expressed. So if these markers are expressed in, say, this cluster, then all this cluster we are going to be naming it as, uh, as uh, a neuronal cluster, uh, marker, um, cluster rather. So if this cluster is expressing only markers of astrocytes, say AQP4, ALDH1, L1, uh, um, um, which other ones of... Uh, it is going to be expressing, we call them canonical markers. You can see it in different, I'm coming, in different, yeah, like the study I talked about, AQP4, this is markers of astrocytes, SLC1, A2, then you have markers of endothelial cells and pericytes, which are FLT1, ROGS. These are genes that are expressed by these cells. Then you have the immune cells. You have the neuron, FB, FOX1, 3, SYT1. You have the oligodendrocytes. The markers of oligodendrocytes is MBP, PLP. The markers of OPC is these and this. So you are, what we'll do is we'll, we are going to test each of these clusters. If they are expressing any of these 
markets. Sometimes, for instance, let's say 24. 24 might be a doublet. It might be ex it might be expressing. Sorry, might be it might be expressing uh, neuronal markers at the same time as immune cells markers. If you are seeing these multiple markers, markers from other cell, other cell types, if you are seeing it in just one cluster, that is a doublet cluster. That means you are going to be removing that particular, uh, that particular cluster. If it's expressing any of these canonical markers and these canonical markers, that means it's expressing oligodendrocytes and OPC, cells, those, those are doublets. Sometimes a cluster might be expressing um, uh, markers of oligodendrocyte because of cell, markers of oligodendrocyte, immune cells might be expressing like four different kinds of markers from different kinds of uh, cell types. So that means it contains, that particular cluster contains uh, multiplex, that is it adds different kind of cell types in it. So we are going to be removing that particular cluster until we are having clusters that are expressing only just one cell type. You get, let me show you example because the code is not, uh, I don't know why it is not running. Let me show you example of some of the uh, things I've been able to do. Um, okay. This is a, a study of Parkinson disease and Parkinson. So yeah, you can see different points like what I've done before. So this is a cluster, this is a cluster, cluster name. And um, from this, I plotted a violin plot to see which of the clusters, uh, I mean, I, what markers I express in each of the cluster. I have 22 clusters here, and these are 22. Each row here, uh, I mean, the rows here are the cluster, while the y-axis here is the expression level. So you can see that cluster, I said, yeah, I said cluster seven and 22 which is this and this, are expressing OPC markers, which are vacant this and this. They're expressing these three, only just three markers. That means this is, this is not a doublet. So cluster four, eight, 21, 22, cluster four, eight, 21, 22. I said they are expressing astrocyte markers, which are GFAP, AQP4, ALDH one L one SLC one A two, so you can see they're expressing it. So all other clusters are not expressing any of these uh, markers, and no other markers from other cell types are expressed in this cluster. So cluster two and twenty one are expressing only microglia markers. Two and twenty one. This is two and sorry. Yeah, this is 21 and 22, yeah. Okay, 21 and 22 express astrocyte markers, and also they are expressing microglia markers, which are these P2RY2F, C1QB, CX3CR1. So that means cluster 21 is a what? It's a double, cluster 21 is a doublet. This is cluster 21. This is the color, but the color is faint. It's the this cluster two, the color of cluster two has overshadowed uh, 21. If you look critically, you will see like a red kind of pointed cells there. So that's 21 is a doublet because it's expressing microglia markers and astrocyte markers. That means we have to remove this cluster 21. Also, here it's a cluster 22 is a doublet expressing OPC cells and astrocyte cells. You can see cluster 22 OPC cells, which are VCAN, MEGF, and this one is expressing it. Then cluster 22 also is expressing GFEP, it's expressing AKP4, 
express ELD uh, and express this one. So this cluster 22, where is it? Yeah, cluster 22, this particular cluster is a doublet. So we have to remove it. So we remove it using uh, subset function. So subset function in that, you, let's say we'll name it, a, we name it this, we assign it this, then we write subset. Yeah. <coughs> <clears throat> Sorry, you write subset, then you write the name of the um, object. If it's this object, then you're given the identity. The identity is the cluster equals to, then the number of clusters that are relevant, that are not, uh, that are not expressing two markers from, um, they are now expressing markers from two different cell types. So for instance, we have from zero to 20. So you now write zero, you put it into quote, zero, one, two, till you reach 20. So once you get to 20, you run this, you run this code. So once you run this code, the uh, the clusters that will be left will be from cluster zero. Will be from cluster zero to cluster twenty. It would have removed cluster twenty one and twenty two. Then after then you rerun this particular you rerun this set of code again. This um, set of code, you will run it to get to this side to see those clusters like this. You, you know, visualize the clusters. Then you also do the, another round of um, conserved markers. After doing a round of conserved markers, you check again there are doublets till everything is till it is clean. There is no doublet in it. You know, this set of, this UMAP again, I analyzed for other markers, you know, ciliated markers, cluster 14 is expressing ciliated markers, this one, cluster 19 is expressing fibroblast markers, cluster 20 is expressing innate immune cells like the T cells and the B cells, markers, that's cluster 20, yeah. Then cluster 19 is expressing fibroblast. Cluster 19, yeah, I said to cluster 14 is express related and all that. So you check if multiple clusters are expressing just um, one markers from one cell. So if at the end of the day, you are going to be left with at the end of the day, I was left with, uh, yeah, I run the test, do the another test, run it, see. At the end of the day, this is the old UMAP, the cleaned one. So cluster 014712, 014712. This cluster is oligodendrocyte cell. Then cluster two, this cluster is astrocyte. Then cluster eight, is cluster cluster eight is endophilia cell. Cluster nine is pericyte. This cluster nine, that's pericyte. Cluster five, eleven. Cluster five, eleven, thirteen, sixteen. This cluster and this are neuronal cluster. Then cluster fifteen. This cluster fifteen. Yeah, this cluster 15 is expressing C cells and B cells, that's immune cell. Cluster 10, ciliated cell. Cluster 3 is microglia. Cluster C is OPC. Yeah, and cluster 14 
is fibroblast. So at the end of the day, you have different cells on this, uh, on this cluster. So from there, you can carry out downstream analysis, whether you want to answer, okay, I want to check, for instance, I am working on astrocytes. What I will just do is I will extract this astrocyte using the subset function that I just told us. I will just put in two instead of instead of one, two, is it? Instead of one, two, three, I will just put cluster two. And I will just do it. So after that, it will just be left. I will just be left with only this cluster. Then I can continue doing some other analysis on this cluster. If I want to find um, um, subpopulation, sub subtypes means from this, there could be subpopulation of cells. Like you can have astrocyte zero, astrocyte one, astrocyte two. Astrocyte zero could be homeostatic cluster, while astrocyte one could be um, um, could be um, activated astrocyte clusters and all that. So I can further, I can ask further questions on this cluster. What are the genes that I express? Okay, I want to check for uh, the heterogeneity. That is um, how many cell, how many subpopulation are there in these particular clusters? So I can ask different kinds of questions. Then the only thing I would just need is do computational analysis, then start writing different code and um, different things. So to give me the question I'm asking. Yeah, so that's it. You can see here I subset. Here I'm working on astrocytes, so I removed this astrocyte and I did the same analysis on the astrocyte. So I removed some doublets, some of the um, clusters here. I express a doublet, I removed the doublet, I checked the QC, I did it. At the end of the day, I was left with these two clusters, cluster zero and cluster one. Yeah. So then I did further analysis, then ask some questions, then clusters zero, this is cluster zero, this is cluster one, cluster zero is expressing homeostatic marker, homeostatic markers, while cluster two is expressing markers of activated astrocytes, such as CLU, APOE. APOE is uh, a marker of, uh, of um, um, uh, Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. So all these markers I express are activated markers. So I have homeostatic and activated clusters of astrocytes. These are some of the genes that I express in O1. Then these are genes that I express in astrocyte 2. So you can ask different kinds of questions. Depends on the question you're asking, depends on the kind of analysis that you are going to be carrying out. Then you can do gene ontology. You can say, okay, what are the diseases that are related to astrocyte zero, for instance, in this, or astrocyte two. You know, in this astrocyte zero, these are the diseases that are like, not that normal, that disease that could happen if this, cluster expressing that particular, those particular uh, markers. Then cluster two, these are diseases that are related to cluster two. You have, because it's an, it's an activated cluster, then you have inflammation, you can have tauopathies, Alzheimer's disease, familiar Alzheimer's disease, dementia. So you can do gene ontology, then you can do uh, I mean, sorry, disease ontology, then this is gene ontology. You want to check the cellular components of astrocyte of the <clears throat> subpopulation zero and two. These are cellular components. You have the neuron spine, the dendritic spine, different kind of analysis that you want. It depends on how, how vast you are in computational, in writing codes and the kind of question that you want to answer. So yeah, yeah. 
that is like, but this particular step that I just showed us from QC to our um, cluster, another uh, <clears throat> cluster generation of cluster, that is basic for any kind of analysis you want to do on single nucleus on single cell RNA sequencing. So everybody must do it that is working on single cell. You have to do it. Then after getting your UMAP like this, after getting your clean UMAP, you can now decide anything you want to do. It depends on the question you are asking. So you can choose my, the analysis I'm doing after this might be different from the analysis someone else is doing after getting this UMAP. So it varies. That's what they call <clears throat> downstream analysis. So you can analyze for different kinds of, you can ask different kinds of questions and analyze for it. So, yeah. Okay, in the, the okay, um, Dr. Fatuki said he found this code online. Yeah, this is the code I used and I don't know why it is not working. This object means the object that I, sorry. Yeah. It's the same code that I use. This is the object. The object from here is the one I'm using here, so. Is the same code that you have posted that I used. So I don't know why it is not working. It's no, it is not the zoo is there. So I don't know why the code is not working. It's correct. Everything I put here is correct. So it what it's just saying is it could not find this function. And I don't know why I say you could not find the function. It's find markers. So yeah, that is all about um, analysis for single cell. Is there any other question? Hello? Hello? Can anybody hear me? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, so um, um, I'm done with the analysis. Uh, well done, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. I, I have uh, this uh, question. Okay. Uh, how is the, what is the relationship between this uh, cell with all this uh, other uh, like uh, <coughs> this uh, Q2 edge R, is it, are they performing the same function? Yeah, so all this DCQ2, it's like, for instance, you want to carry out, let's say, doublet analysis. There is a, there is a, there is a, uh, uh, a, a software. So all these DCQ are like a software to do some parts of the analysis. You might not use CRAT, right, to do the analysis. You might use DCQ, but the DCQ does not do the complete analysis. It could just be a set, a part of this analysis that the DCQ will do. Then you can continue the other part of the analysis by importing your result into this CRA, uh, making it a CRA object. Right. All right, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. So there is a there is a there is a software for um, calculating the doublet for removing the doublet. It's called SC Dubnet -Dub or kind of. So that that one after getting your after getting this object, you subject it to that particular software to remove the doublet. It will help you calculate and show some you you show some plots. You visualize the 
um, the graphs and everything to remove those doublets. After you have removed the doublet, it can only perform removal of doublets for uh, removal of doublets. Then you are going to re the results of that particular software. You are going to import it into Syrat, then continue. Sir, please can we get the scripts that they used today, sir? Yeah, so um, this script off record, can we stop the uh, the recording? Sorry. Mm -hmm. Any other so, questions, please? So if you go through, if you want to, if you want any other question or probably you want to do further, any other analysis that is not relevant to what I have done, but what I have shown you today is the basic one you have to do. So if you read this vignet, you want to, you want to answer any question that are related to your work, you can read this and get some of the code that they use. Once you get it, you'll be able to answer. You want to read it and you understand. You'll be able to answer uh, many of the uh, of the question. And if you you are not uh, experienced in writing code, or you don't know how to explain this code, you don't know what it means. You can get in contact with someone that is small. Uh, that know how to write, that know how to write code, or you can probably send me a message to explain the meaning of the code to you and what the code does. Yeah, you have many vignettes here. You can go through the vignette and, you know, get it. It's okay. Thank you. Do we have other questions?